Good evening, everyone. From a beautiful fall day on the Carnegie Mellon campus, I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's event, Heading to the Point, The Power of Representation. I'm Keith Webster, Helen and Henry Posner, Jr., Dean of University Libraries, and it's my great pleasure to be part of what is going to be a remarkable event. Here at the University Libraries, we are committed to recognizing the importance of representation and diversity. We have a number of initiatives centered around recognizing and growing diversity throughout the campus community, several of which you'll hear learn more about tonight. Many thanks to my colleagues who have been working hard to prioritize this important work. Tonight, I'm particularly grateful to Sonia Wellington, our events manager, who looked after all of the logistics for this event, as well as our entire external relations team and the team at the Office of the Vice Provost for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion. It's my great pleasure to introduce you to this evening's host, Dr. Wanda Heading Grant. Wanda is Carnegie Mellon's inaugural Vice Provost for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion and Chief Diversity Officer. She also holds a faculty appointment as Distinguished Service Professor in the Heinz College of Information Systems and Public Policy. Throughout Wanda's 30-year career in higher education, she has established programs, policies, and practices fundamental to the advancement of inclusive excellence and DEI. Her wealth of professional experience and volunteer involvement on the boards of nonprofit organizations and civil rights committees have earned her a reputation as a cultural architect able to build and sustain real and lasting change. Joining Wanda this evening in conversation is award-winning novelist, college professor, and CMU alumna, Dr. Jewel Parker Rhodes. Jewel has a rather special story about Hunt Library, where I'm sitting just now. I hope she'll share this story with us at this event, but let me just say that an instance of encountering representation in the Hunt Library stacks kick-started Jewel's literary passion. Since that moment, she has had an incredibly successful and impactful career. In 2021, she was awarded an honorary doctorate of humane letters by the CMU, joining her CMU bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees. And so I describe her as a four-time CMU alum. She's the author of seven books for children, including the New York Times bestsellers, Black Brother, Black Brother, and Ghost Boys, which has won over 30 honors and awards. She has also written adult novels, a memoir and writing guides. And for those of you on campus, we have a small display of Jewel's work in honor of this evening's event on the first floor of Hunt Library. Jewel has won the American Book Award, the Black Caucus of the American Library Association Award for Literary Excellence, a Coretta King, Scott King Honor Award, and the Jane Addams Peace Association Book Award. Jewel is currently the founding artistic director of the Virginia G. Piper Center for Creative Writing, Narrative Studies Professor, and Virginia G. Piper Endowed Chair at Arizona State University. I'm also delighted that Jewel is a member of the Carnegie Mellon University Library's Dean's Advocacy Council, and she is an increasingly important ambassador and advocate for our work. Towards the end of this event, you will also have a chance to hear from my colleague, Crystal Johnson, the community collections archivist in the libraries. Crystal's primary role is to increase representation in the university archives, both by making collections featuring underrepresented groups available to students and researchers, but also by building connections across campus with student groups and organizations so that we can accurately record their history. Crystal will share some highlights of her work with us and how it enriches our community's understanding of Carnegie Mellon's diverse history. Thank you again for joining us this evening. And without further ado, I'll turn things over to Wanda and to Jewel. Thank you both. Thank you, Keith. Um, wow, I don't know how I'm going to show up with this wonderful woman that I keep calling a queen. And, um, and I love when she smiles because it is absolutely the truth. Hello, Jewel. Hello, Wanda. How are you today? 
Uh, I'm doing well, and I was um, just so worn by Dean Webster's uh, earlier comments because I just think it's such a wonderful thing that yes. we're at this time of our culture where we're finally super committed to DEI and we're all pulling in the same wonderful yes. direction. That's right. That's right. Well, I, you know, I'm not sure who's all out there, but I welcome you. It's my, I'm in my office. Um, I'm sure Jules is in her home in her office and maybe, but we're welcoming you to our living room right now, our, you know, our family room. And let me tell you, I was excited about the opportunity to have a conversation with Jewel, but I did not know how she was going to just knock my socks off when I first had a conversation with her. Um, it was supposed to be 30 minutes. I think it was maybe an hour, 15 minutes later that we got off the phone and we laughed and my jaws hurt. And um, and I was like, I can't wait for this. So I'm inviting everyone into our, our space today to hear part of the conversation, hear, hear, hear our conversation. One of the things I wanted to say about what really just sort of stood out to me and, and we got to this part of the title around representation is because so much of what I understood and knew um, about this author that's sitting across from me really just resonated with me. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm just going to share a few little tidbits here about myself. I went to a predominantly white institution. I went to that institution site unseen. I arrived there um, not knowing exactly what I was going to get into. I I'm a first generation college student. I chose the school that I um, chose because I didn't have any um, role models or anyone to tell me anything different or to look for certain things. I also was not able to go and visit the school. I didn't even know anything about the, the, the you know, how, how do you say, admitted student visit days or those kinds of things. I went when we could afford to go, which was when school started. And so there were times when um, I yearned for seeing someone and being with people that looked like me, that somewhat sounded like me, something. And um, it didn't always exist. But here's the other great part. There's the part that's great, though, that I was welcomed and I was embraced. And there were things that I knew that I did not have and to my total preparation um, for being where I was at. And, um, and folks helped me to not just survive, but to also thrive. And then the third thing that happened, one, I'm at a place that I, maybe not the only one, but it felt like that. Two, not quite sure how to navigate being in college, but I found my way and I had help. There were people. And three, it was the beginning of more of a formal journey for me around justice and, and equity and inclusivity and understanding it. I always did the work um, given who I am, but it really became more formal. So when I think about that and I think about what I was initially told about Joel, I was like, we got to talk. And then we did. And boy, I was like, I'm going to say a few things in the beginning but I want people to hear all about your story. See them, you should, if they're not, I know they are though, very proud of having you as one of its alumni and alumni. And I am so glad that we're having this conversation. So with that in mind, what I want to do is really invite you to tell me about and tell all of us about somewhat about your upbringing, your background. How did you end up at CMU? And, um, and, and, and you know, I, maybe at some point we're going to get to when you show up with your daishiki. Uh, I'm like, I can't wait to hear that again. So, <laughs> so in that regard, tell, and, you know, I invite you to, sh to share with us a little bit about how you got to CMU. I, I, I'm ha I'm happy to do that. Um, without a doubt, Carnegie Mellon transformed my life, transformed my children's lives and my grandchild's life. And for that, I'm going to always, always be grateful. Mm -hmm. I had two most lucky things in my life. My grandmother, who when I was a little girl, she would say, Jewel child, there's <laughs> nobody better in the world than you. And you're no better than anybody else. 
we're all a mixed blood stew. And that idea of mixed blood stew, of how, you know, we're part of the same genetic gene pool still informs my work today. You know, that literally skin tone is but another superficial difference and that we want to break down the barriers that keep us from seeing one another and communicating with one another. Now, when I was a little girl, though, I was pretty lonely. I was pretty shy, pretty sad because my mother had left the family when I was eight months old. Uh, and my sister and I were raised with my cousins by my grandmother and aunt and father and uncle in this big extended house on the north side of Pittsburgh. And even then, I was a reader. Teachers, librarians started giving me books, and I'd read and read and read. And most of those stories are about, well, not most of those stories, all those stories were about about white kids, right? And they all seemed to live on a farm, uh, though I did like reading. And also about dogs. I identified greatly with the dogs that were hurt unfairly. And then, of course, were transformed with human kindness, you know. Mm -hmm. So basically be trying to give myself uh, what I needed. But I wrote stories all the time. And my first story was in the third grade. It was called The Last Scream at Homewood Elementary School. And my teacher let me walk. The Last Scream? Last scream, so you know how it ended, Wanda. <laughs> you know, and I illustrated it too. And actually, I still have that book. But I remember that connection when I was telling my story, and students were like, "Oh, yay!" Um, but afterwards, shortly after that, my mother, who I hadn't seen in eight years, decided to come back and raise the family, and she took us all to California. And that was just heartbreaking for me. Mm -hmm. And there I really found the power of the arts, that that was the way in which I could express myself. Also, since I didn't see myself in books, I could see Black people doing sports. I could see Black people entertaining, you know, on TV. So it's sort of like, oh, I can do that. Right. Very, yes, very much wanted to be out of where I was. I wanted to be in a far, far happier place. And actually, my mother, when I was 15 years old, she decided to divorce my father and ended up kicking me out of the house. And I remember saving money and being at the Ontario airport, getting in one of those little prop planes wow. to LAX. And my father was standing on the on the tarmac because you could do that then. And they were playing, is it Mamas and Papas? I forget the song. <laughs> on leaving on a jet plane. <laughs> Don't know when, when I'll, I'll be back, back again. again. <laughs> and I went back home to Pittsburgh and grandma. And I had the knowledge wow. that my drama teacher in California said, oh, you should go to Carnegie Mellon. I think it's in Chicago. <laughs> grandma <laughs> said, oh no, it's here. I was 15 wow. years old. I was so young. 15. I was really young. And grandma put me in Allegheny Community College because she was worried that I would become Um, you know, someone who didn't go to college, you know, which as first generation, many of my family didn't. She was also afraid that I would end up in jail as many folks in my family unfortunately did, or else that I would be a teen mother as many folks in my family, including my mother um, were. So she sent me off to community college while I waited for my audition for drama school at Carnegie Mellon. Now, to be clear, my educational background was very poor of the discrepancy between what children of color are taught in public schools versus, you know, kids who are white, say more affluent suburbia is just horrific and it's still going on today. When I applied to college, every single college turned me down, which is irony because now, you know, I'm Dr. Rhodes. The school that accepted me was Carnegie Mellon because I could sing, dance, and act. And they were starting an inaugural theater dance program. But you know what? There were about seven of us, seven of us, Um, and four of us were people of color. Three of us were black, one was Asian. And when I thought back on those days, you know, we had a black writer 
in residence. We had a black director in residence. I got to do a main stage show that was about anti-apartheid, that there were ways in which the arts and Carnegie Mellon drama did give me representation, okay. which started to fill me up and Ooh. make me feel as though I was growing into a person. I want it more. I want it more. You were finding yourself. Yes, you were exactly. finding yourself. I exactly. And so theater was like, oh, you know, you know, we, we support, or as you said at Vermont, that sense of inclusivity and being held close to, you know, the art of, you know, your fellow students and your fellow professor. And one day, and I don't know why I was going into the library, because sorry, Dean Webster, we didn't go into the library a lot. Because <laughs> <laughs> drama, you know, I think I forgive you. <laughs> but yes, but I but I went into the library and uh -huh. on the new fiction shelf uh -huh. by Gail Jones called Corregidor. And I read that book and it was about the slave trade. Uh -huh. And that was the first time that I had ever, ever seen myself in a book. By then I was 19 years old. And wow. the next day I was switching my major to English and I ran to Dean Stanley Steinberg because I was poor. I had no money. We could talk about that later, but I was worried. I couldn't afford to go to school longer than four years. I was barely making it, you know, through my junior year. And I remember Dean Steinberg saying, oh, I've got the degree for you. And he opened up you know, his um, file folder, and he pulled out this degree in drama criticism. He says, nobody's ever taken it before because you have to do two years in theater, be accepted there, and then two oh. years in English. But if you do this, you'll graduate on time. And I okay. said, hallelujah. <laughs> it was in English, though, where I was mm -hmm. the only person of color. And it was different because when I started writing, I wanted to write about what I knew, how I had grown up you know, things that were true to my community and show the humanity of that. And I remember my classmates saying, how come you didn't tell me your characters were black? And I'd go, well, how come you don't tell me your characters are white? And I learned the real tragedy, the Wanda. Wow. I had learned to read white, mm -hmm. that I had been, you know, acculturated waiting for someone to say, hey, it's, you know, a person of color. And the tragedy is that through all of my English courses, you know, many, many years, I never once read anyone who was a person of color. And wow. that was a problem, I think, for the time. But in terms of the professors, in terms of loving and supporting me, I couldn't have asked for anything more. And in fact, if my writing teacher, David Walton, had said, you know, you know, sorry, you can't write these stories or you can't do this. I would have tucked tail and I would have run uh, because I was so insecure in my own agency, my own voice. And with time, Carnegie Mellon gave me the educational background. And I remember running to the library, Dean Webster, running to the library. <laughs> <laughs> what people were talking about before I could figure out what my homework was. Uh -huh. Just making up double wow. time and having, you know, teachers help me with my writing, not just English teachers, but philosophy teachers. And one thing that I had, that I would always say to myself, even though I was ill prepared for college, was I still smart? You know, could I learn it? And that sense of, yes, I could, had been echoed in theater, had been echoed in English. And so I did work. And in fact, I got graduated with 4.0 as an undergraduate and graduated with uh, distinguished letters for, for my doctoral degree. And that's when my eyes went so bad, I had to start wearing wearing glasses. <laughs> well, you say something very interesting, Joel, because Joel, because you know that all of us don't get that in terms of being told that we're smart or or the sense of that we can do it, um, and and so I mean I, I remember being struck by that when we were talking before, and um, and 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 sometimes that is missing so much that that played a significant part 
in you really being able to move forward. And, and Absolutely. Exit. And to have someone to see, to recognize my, my talent, and particularly in a time, and I hope it's a lot less now. I also remember when I did my GREs that some people said, oh, you, they weren't very good. Oh, you, you can't go to graduate school. But I remember twice that scores from SAT and GRE uh -huh. sort of stopped would have stopped things for me, uh -huh, you know, uh -huh. just, who knew, just, just, just because I could sing and dance, I was able to break through. And one story I shared with you is that I remember in California being in the fifth grade with a student, an Hispanic girl, and we were the two smartest girls in the class, what smartest kids ever. And we got, you know, great scores on our fireman's test. So we yeah. were being invited to the fireman's picnic. And um, actually it was interesting because later uh, a black teacher came to me and said, you know, you got the highest score. I actually didn't care because I was going with a friend. I was, wasn't going to be alone, but I can see how in terms of representation that she thought it was important for me to know and maybe for her to know that I had done really, really well. And literally years later, I'm becoming uh, an associate professor. I've been you know, invited to campus at Cal State Northridge. I'm getting my badge and you know my id card and the person taking the picture was in fact my fifth grade classmate who had not gone to college who had not moved beyond environments for, for whatever reason and yet i knew you know she's gifted there are millions millions exactly of kids okay. who, who are are gifted and might need support and love and yet if the world doesn't have representation if you don't see if you don't know that these other avenues exist and i had learned that also through just imagination and fiction and then through my wonderful teachers then you can just you know not even take that risk to say oh i'd be interested in trying this but there is no reason that at that point we should have had such a gap between uh -huh. equity and achievement if you were saying based upon on talent i just had more perhaps who knows who knows the stories but i had i know i had more opportunity and the other thing oh and i love carnegie the other thing is that they never ever wanted anything than excellence always uh -huh. and so standards were never changed it was like okay you have to meet them and i remember the first time in graduate school i had to analyze a poem for the class and uh -huh. Anne Hayes said it was an edward arlington poem and Anne Hayes said no that's not it and then very politely and kindly you know went back to the whole poem and explained all the things that i should have been like explaining or include uh, uh -huh. she managed to say that no you're wrong but to teach me with such a loving embrace that i kept working and kept working and three years later i wrote a, a paper 26 paper page paper on dylan thomas's a refusal to mourn 13 lines of a poem and she wrote at the bottom of my paper yes yes that's it I have every single paper, every single comment from every single person at Carnegie Mellon. And I setting the bar high, which is another thing, it helps with representation because you do feel, and I don't know if you felt this, Wanda, you do feel that sense of um, that, that, that you're fake or, or you're not um, authentic. What is, um, what, oh, what's the oh, phrase? The, the oh, imposter, you're talking about the imposter syndrome? The imposter syndrome. Uh -huh. And that haunted me for years. And in particular, it haunted me because, um, you know, there wasn't much attention given to African American literature. But I now recognize that I was part of the generation. By the time I graduated, they were saying, can you teach African American literature? Can you teach women's studies? That I was part of the people who became that wave that got into the academy, women's studies, ethnic studies, that you know, we were we were in fact the vanguard and how we've made a difference, you know, that way, which I think that sense of agency 
in belief in your voice, I still got from Carnegie Mellon. Very often still my family or my community, it was sort of like I became much more like a stranger in a strange land. That it was like, you know, um, um, I, I remember my father even saying, I don't, I don't understand. I don't, I don't get why you like the things that you do. And right. I think now we have much more of a sense that rather than liking things that society lets you see or have access to, that for everyone, regardless of color, regardless of gender, regardless of regender, religion, you know, ethnic background, et cetera, should have access to everything. Everything. Yes, there, this everything. person is an astronomer. We didn't know, or this is the great violinist, and we didn't know. So we just need to keep pushing. Yes. We need to keep pushing. Well, you make, so there's a few things that have come to mind. The, the first thing I, I, I sort of want to say is that, you know, to whom much is given, much is expected and required. And I think as educators and, 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 and those of us who are very specifically in certain um, kinds of professions, that we cannot afford to be leaving millions of talent on the table. And part of us um, that happening has a lot to do with the not nurturing and fostering and caring and the kindness um, um, that we should be providing to all children, to all Absolutely. people. Um, and I think that there's an aspect in here that I hear from you, but I know for myself, if not being provided that level of access and opportunity along with my own talent and ability that I could have been left somewhere and my talent on the table and we would not be having this conversation. And so one, I call to, to, to the attention of um, folks who are K through 12 and post-secondary to really, you know, I applaud the work that they do and also the understanding of how the important role that they play. The second thing for me, even as you talked about the imposter syndrome or just bringing it up, I also put out there what some of the scholars are talking about in terms of, you know, some of that, um, I hear that folks believe they have it, but I also have started to lean myself towards it, it. You know, we have to question some of the inequities and biases that are in the system that mm -hmm. really is more of the problem rather than me feeling like an imposter or that I don't have it. It is what's happening there. But then the third thing I want to say that brings me to where I want to go is, um, you write to a, a, a specific audience in terms of uh, around really thinking about our young people, eighth graders and middle schoolers and the topics that you're writing about. Oh, my God, around privilege and race and justice. And um, your books are saying so much and leading. Um, you said something to me that stood out, which was. Um, the first in the first conversation in some ways. And I absolutely agree after finished reading Ghost Boys is how your books were way ahead of where we were at as a society and thinking about some of the stuff that uh, we think about. And so I, um, be, be, even, like be, even before um, Ghost Boys, but just even thinking about that piece, can you share a little bit? I love the word you said, you know, giving... Uh, black, black and brown children and others, the agency and the work that you've been doing around um, social justice and equity. I mean, it's, it's fascinating. And okay. just, thank you. I appreciate Absolutely. the championship. You know, I do think that I went through that period when I was younger, that I needed my, I needed Carnegie in the environment um, to sort of set me on my two feet and give me the resources to assert myself. And I wanna to say to the K through 12 and college students, all the enrichment programs that you do, they matter, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, don't judge children by their 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 numbers, but to, to see beyond. Um, so uh, you have to keep doing that. I, I also wanna add in that my biggest problem was money. Um, and I don't know whether Carnegie Mellon has this, but I remember times not having enough, enough to eat and crying and my grandmother having dressed to dress up and bring me uh, cans of food because even though uh, I got financial aid and I can tell you a wonderful story about that, but um, the, uh, my parents kept claiming me as an independent 
um, could pay me, me on their tax returns, but they didn't give me any money. So I even went to work at Carnegie Mellon working in ski boat and I wasn't supposed to as a dramatic because our program is all day long. So I think there are also ways in which that it really also was poverty that would have pushed me out, that I needed just a little bit more help um, than I was getting, but there's that is. But then I think once I found out that Black people wrote books, I immediately started with uh, voodoo dreams. My grandmother, I believe, was a hoodoo woman. She taught me about spirituality and signs and holistic healing. And I remember sitting in a history of science class at Carnegie and the professor saying that the only people that had done anything worth knowing about or caring about in science was the Western community. And I knew that couldn't be true, but I didn't have the substance to back it up. Uh -huh. So I went in search of, you know, other stories and, and went in search of why does voodoo have the stereotypical um, response in America and what is the true African diaspora spiritual tradition. And writing that book, it grew me up because actually in that book, a black woman walks, walks on water. And you can actually look at the Daily Picayune and find a newspaper where the newspaper says it's true. Marie Laveau walked on water. And by the time I finished that book, I went from being Jewel Parker, Drew Rhodes or Jewel Parker, you know, to being <laughs> I am, I am am mm -hmm. that I was able to grow myself up that why couldn't a black woman have power why couldn't a black woman walk on water why couldn't a woman you know make this kind of transformation and then from that I got interested from a parade magazine article in the Tulsa race massacre so I'm the first person to write a fictional account about the Tulsa race massacre in 1998. And the Ku Klux Klan would send me hate mail and I'd see them in Oklahoma. Uh, I'd get a great review for the o Tulsa World in Oklahoma, but the book editor would tell me at a conference, oh no, we can't publish that. I tell, I believe me, it's not personal. And that literally the book disappeared because people wanted to believe that massacre didn't happen. And now the book has been reissued because a hundred years later, you know, the narrative is much more clear. People are now beginning to accept that it happened. So I think I was trying to gather a cultural framework for me to live in. And then after that, I went to Douglas and his Jewish wife, Jewish mistress and his black wife, so on and so forth, you know. So anything having to do with women and people of a different ethnic group, woo you know, I love people. But now I think I'm in my writing for youth. I always knew that I wanted to write for youth, but I didn't think I was good enough. Mm -hmm. And I thought kids deserved my very best. So I wrote all those adult novels, practicing, trying to get ready. And I'm so glad I did because I take prejudice, privilege, bias, racism. I take real world problems. I take 9-11. I take colorism. And I find a way to tell it in a story yeah. that children can relate and begin to discuss that I'm not trying to patronize them. And this week, I um, they're, well, they're making a film of Ghost Boys. They're making a film of Black Brother, Black Brother. Um, Sesame Street, Apple TV, they have this series called Ghost Writer. And they yes. have a new season out. And the last two episodes are based on my book Bayou Magic and it shows this beautiful black African mermaid Mami Wada and someone said I think this is the first time I've ever seen you know an African mermaid you know in Hollywood but the tale was that you know African mermaids followed the ships of the enslaved and wherever slaves went they remained in the water, water. Oh. And no hey your community is still here so I think now I'm not yes I'm not an imposter though I, I can tell you just last week, somebody thought I was a service girl and little kids ask me all the time, Jewel, do you, do you have racism every darn week? Um, and I've discovered um, that I can be dressed uh, in several thousand dollars worth of clothes, which I used to do when I was younger, you know, Jewel Parker Rosie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and a white person would turn to me and say, can you get us some more hot water for our tea? 
Or I could be with a date at the Princeton Club, staying at the Princeton Club, and we're getting off the elevator, going to our room, and a white couple might say, say to me, well, can you clean my room now? Missing oh, the whole social cues, or being at the Arizona Biltmore um, with my family, my son and my daughter, and having you know um, a white couple pass me by, and the gentleman wanting to know when I was going to sing, which actually I don't oh. mind. Thing. <laughs> you know, but but, but do, oh. that, that those things still present my day and yes. what is even though is that they can still hurt they can still make me cry but that's why in terms of external appearance I don't put much talk in that because there's a phrase that no matter where you go you still be black and I must tell you no matter where I go there are still some people who see my skin color and just put me in a category like one gentleman down in North Carolina who offered me five dollars to have sexual relations with him behind the back of the store and it goes on and I'm on. jumping out of my skin Joel I yes, mean it's not great. that I don't know these things but you know um I told you and I told people who are here how I felt about how I see you and oh. just um and and um it, it, it does sort of hurt to to know that that you've had that experience and and even the last one um you know i have this phrase um that a colleague here says you know um gonna hoodie up and i'm like i'm ready to hoodie up for you it's like people stop and um we got a lot of work to do yeah. one of the things i want to turn to because is that we're having a conversation and i'm watching some questions come in and i want to begin to invite other folks to ask some questions because some of the things that you've said i have people it looks like they're they're saying tell us more about being you know Growing up in Pittsburgh, someone is asking um, about uh, wanting to hear a little bit more about your upbringing here. And, and what it made me think about, you had told a story about even just um, your familiarity and not familiarity, thinking about even, you know, August Wilson and, um, and um, um, whatever's coming to mind for you. Folks want to hear a little bit more about that, about um, in terms of um, your experience. I I think I was meant to be a playwright. And if I was back in school now, I'd probably study screenwriting because dialogue is my thing. <laughs> All right now. Wilson hadn't quite made his, his move uh, mm -hmm. and I wasn't aware of it. Uh, though I was in Pittsburgh, uh, downtown at a hotel at a writer's conference. And I was sitting with August Wilson, John Edgar Weidman, his cousin, um, oh, and I'm blanking out on his name, but his cousin wrote a very well-received first novel. And there's actually a photograph of his cousin, who was a photographer for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, that they took of me when I was in my fair lady all dressed up. And I've got that picture. Oh, but you I have to show it to me. He's, I will. I'll three three artistic gentlemen from Pittsburgh, from the Hill District, uh, from Homewood, and feeling as though I had died and gone gone to heaven. I did not know that they existed. My folks were steel mill folks, you know, and my grandmother, you know, was the caretaker of all the children in her household. And when I left my grandmother, you know, my grandmother, of course, was devastated, as was I. Uh, but my dashiki story was when I came back from California, I was a Black power Afro child, and I oh, had right a, now. <laughs> I had an afro that was bigger than Angela Davis's. Had my daishiki. I had my sword. So think of the Black Panther, Wakanda. That's what yes. I looked like. Plus, I had my love beads. They told me it was cold in Pittsburgh. I came back. It was January, so I brought a sweater. And grandma took me down to Mellon Bank, right in central downtown. And she was dressed up like she was going to church. She had on her <laughs> skirt and she had her hat. And my grandma, Amen. who was also a, a part-time reverend, who was even okay. part-time <laughs> reverend. And in those days, the black men did the most um, risk life-taking jobs, you know, really dangerous jobs in the steel mill. And they drove me to the bank and there was this middle-aged white man who my grandmother was saying she wanted to borrow $500 so she could buy me some winter clothes and have me go to Allegheny Community College while we were waiting to see if I got into CMU. Um, and this guy kept looking at her and looking at me and looking at her. 
Um, and he kept saying, what's your collateral? What's your collateral? Well, grandma didn't have any collateral. <laughs> in her tax on the house. And my grandmother pointed to me and she said, she's my collateral. And this white man, middle-aged white man, when, and I think the president's gonna help me find him one day, said, a smart girl, that's very good collateral. And I swore, I jumped up and down and I thought to myself, this white man reads books because <laughs> books teach empathy. And he said yes to us. And we went right next door to learners and got me my winter coat and some pants and all that kind of stuff. So reading literature that in that sense of empathy became part of my life. And not only from what my grandmother had told me, but from the demonstrable affection and support that Carnegie Mellon gave me. And I went through my trials trying to give myself permission to speak my voice, trying to say, how come I don't know this history about black people? How come I wasn't, and not just black people, native people, Hispanic people. So now I write stories that include a multi-ethnic community, us Hispanic kids, Vietnamese kids, um, you know, other Chinese kids, black kids, white kids. Uh -huh. And I write stories where the affirmation is of the allyship of all these groups of people coming together like the people came together for Martin Luther King's marches that that is how we change the world mm -hmm. wow. wow you know um gosh uh, there, there's there's two questions that's coming around one there is a question um I think you sort of went there but there is a little bit I I, I think um those on want to hear a little bit more about um maybe if you could talk about in terms of CMU how familiar you were with CMU and 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 um did you feel in terms of when you came and you you got here and you went to CMU what did you know about CMU nothing absolutely nothing, nothing. either when the north side and some black communities are like this, a lot of communities in LA are like this, you know, Chicago are like this, that a child of color can live their entire life and never see a white person. I did not know that white people existed until I was five years old. And grandma took me on the trolley downtown. So uh, Carnegie Mellon, that was like, it could have been the moon. But because I had teachers in school who would say, oh, Jewel should, should do this, Jewel should do that. They hooked me up with the University of Pittsburgh. I do not remember Carnegie Mellon program at the time, but I went to the University of Pittsburgh for a summer. And that was the first time that I was in a, among school, elementary school children where we were all, um, you know, of different ethnicities, you know, and that it was a, a like a completely new world. And I met these kids who belonged to different class groups and that I knew that there were other children who knew other things, who did other things than I did. So I would also argue, you know, that, um, you know, Carnegie Carly probably has a problem now, but coming to the campus, it was so beautiful, uh -huh. so glorious. I was lucky that I had some black classmates and at least drama but I do remember feeling very 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 lonely and one of the things that can also ha happen is you should not um there's also interracial prejudice as well as intraracial prejudice yes, and yes. I think sometimes we don't give enough attention to intraracial prejudice uh -huh. you know and the combination of how they can echo off one another um and for some reason um I was at, at times ostracized by some of the student student body and some of that did have to do with the color of my skin that I was a little bit too light to maybe be authentically black and when I wrote Voodoo Dreams and went to another university there was this one student who wanted to hit me with a baseball bat because as a light woman, there was no way that I could have written such a black text. So I think there we're not an homogenous group. That's but right. There's ways in which racism has taught the people who are oppressed harmful, hurtful, 
spiteful ideas. And I wrote about this in Season Moon Hurricane, that there actually is a vampire myth in African tradition, that a lot of Africa was colonized by the British, the Dutch, the Portuguese. And so there were African vampire myths where the vampires were actually bureaucrats, just as dressed as bureaucrats, and a lot of times looked like firemen and had buckets of blood. Uh -huh. and, and those vampires suck on your wrist and meant to uh, symbolize that there is a culture that is trying to steal your culture and your love of community wow. and they're sucking your blood so my series wow. the moon hurricane particularly moon is about how racism too is a vampire of sorts that tries to suck one's self-love from one's community so the racism does harm to the person experiencing it that's right as well as to the person you know who who, right. who is racist and so <laughs> that sense of in black brother black brother i write about all heritage is lit and that actually came from personal experience um i'll share this i married um a white man at a time when it was just now legal in maryland for there to be a an interracial marriage. And my husband Brad is 6'4", Norwegian descent, long blonde hair. And now because he's old, he looks like Gandalf. And he's got <laughs> blue eyes. <laughs> and he, 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 I married him because he was a literature major and a computer science major. And we bonded over stories. And he was my true love. He was my tea cake. If any of you know that reference to Zora Neale Hurston. But when we married, I cried. I would not let there be a celebration. We went to the courthouse um, because I was scared to death what the world was going to do to us as an interracial couple. Yes. So I had agreed to marry him, but not have any kids. And he convinced me that I shouldn't patronize my kids. Okay, I won't patronize our kids. Well, sure enough, we had a daughter who looks like her dad, white appearing, uh -huh. a son who looks like me, brown appearing and their life is totally different the things that evan has experienced including you know assaults by police would never in a day hurt hurt kelly and sometimes too i wonder and all of you can think about this had i been a boy had i been very dark would cmu and other places that i've been would they have been as gracious to me then as uh, it was with me being a girl and at that being a somewhat light-skinned girl? And I always think I'm darker than I am. And I always think I'm taller than I am. When I saw my graduation pictures, I'm such a shrimp. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, wow, wow. So so now you've just opened the door for for us to do this again, open the door for us to get to know each other I, even more. I know you're going to be visiting here. We have about just about 90 seconds before I'm supposed to turn it over. But I do, but I do, I, I do like for your last words, like just given what you just ended with, you know, there's one, there's a question here and I think it's important to end with, you know, how do we tell healing stories about the kindness of people that helped with overcoming injustices uh, without negating the real effects of consensus built prejudices. So basically, mm -hmm. I, I know I, it's a big question, but in a short period of time, could you just sort of leave us with any thoughts or ideas that you might have about, you know, the, 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 um, the power of storytelling and how it helps to heal? Uh, storytelling is wonderful. Um, I have always wanted to affirm that, you know, all people are connected by their, by their common humanity. And I'll give you a concrete example. I wrote Ghost Boys and it nearly killed me. And I do urge all of you to read Ghost Boys. Um, in very often, a Black person will be murdered. Emmett Till will be murdered. And the rest of the so story is about society getting itself right. Yes. And one of the things that I didn't want to do was to re-victimize Emmett Till, re-victimize, you know, Black boys that have been murdered through time. And so I found a way to give them agency. 
that all spirits are alive. Are oh, yes, spirits yes, you are did. You did great. it in this book. Yes, yeah, spirits, all of our spirits are too great not to continue to have a lasting impact. So for me, the dead are uh, elder spiritual resources. And to feel that there is agency in telling stories about how the past can inform the present or a present yes. person to make them better. And then that way we see that all of life is this interconnectedness from before, now, and moving into the future. And those are the kinds of stories that I tell to heal. Thank you so much, Jewel Parker Rhodes. You got, do you have my bedroom ready? Cause I'm coming to live with you for a few days. I'm coming to live with you, but you're welcome to come and see me. Every <laughs> well, this is, I'm so appreciative of your honesty, your candor, being very vulnerable, spending some time with me as an inaugural uh, vice provost here at, uh -huh. at, right? I'm loving my time here. I'm loving the people here. And I'm so grateful to have met you. And I can't wait to get to know you um, even more. And um, CMU is definitely blessed that you have um, made this time, your time in your life, uh, um, it's, you know, been a part of your journey here. So thank you again. And um, I just like to again, thank everyone who made this possible. And at this particular time, I am going to turn this over to Crystal Johnson, Community Collection Processing Archivist for the libraries, who will close us out and share more about um, the library's work uplifting historically marginalized stories and voices who have shaped CMU. Thank you. Welcome, Crystal. Thanks, Wanda. Um, as Ke Keith mentioned in his opening statement, um, as a community collections processing archivist, my primary role is to increase representation in the university archives. In 2020, the university libraries curated a, a virtual exhibit titled What We Don't Have, confronting the absence of diversity in the university archives. In this exhibit, my fellow archivists explored the gaps in our archive and acknowledge that our collections are not a true reflection of CMU's diverse community. In the past year, the University Archives has been building a framework towards a better archive. The conversation we heard tonight and Jules' story of finding a sense of belonging by visiting the library illustrates why it's so important and life and like potentially life-changing. Um, it can be for students to be able to see themselves reflected on campus. We want any student to be able to walk into our reading room and be able to find themselves in the university's history. ROAR, uh, which stands for Repairing Our Archival Record, is a community archives initiative dedicated to preserving the history of under-engaged and underrepresented communities at CMU. It includes the voices of alumni, students, student organizations, current and former staff, faculty, as well as programs and committees which have served these com communities. This initiative is heavily influenced by community archives movement, uh, which emphasizes a participatory community-based approach uh, that retains and amplifies the community's voice. We want to fill in the gaps in our collections, uh, but we need to do so in a responsible way. We don't want anyone to feel as if their community history is being tokenized or viewed as a collectible. We're focusing first on having conversations and building relationships both on and off campus. We want you to know that we exist. We're a resource. We value your story and that your community's history is integral. It's an integral part of telling CMU's history. Um, I'd also like to mention a few of our uh, current and upcoming projects. First, um, we're working to make collections from our backlog ready for public use. Two collections which will be made accessible in the upcoming year are the papers of Dr. Gloria Hill and alumni Sanford Freeman. Friedman was a writer who graduated from the College of Fine Arts in 1949. He's best known for his 1965 coming of age novel, Totem Pole. Totem Pole is believed to have the first representation of a gay Jewish protagonist in American fiction. The late Dr. Gloria Hill was a beloved figure on campus. She was the former director of the Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon 
uh, Action Project, also known as CMAP, um, as well as the Assistant Dean of Dietrich College of Humanities and Social Sciences. Secondly, we are also embarking on a few community-based projects, one of which will include Dr. Hill and CMAP's legacy um, and build on the CMAP collection that we're home to. CMAP, for those of you who are unfamiliar, was founded in 1968 with the aim to increase the recruitment and retention of African-American students at CMU. In 2006, it was renamed Carnegie Mellon Advising Resource Center, or CMARC. Um, the program expanded to serve Hispanic, Latinx, and Native American students. These programs helped students of color find community at CMU and provided resources that helped them succeed in their academic pursuits. I've been talking with former CMARC staff members about how we can build a fuller history of these programs, which has left such a la lasting impact on so many. We're in the very early stages, um, and we'll have more details in the new year about how you can get involved in future projects. We're also collaborating with our friends at the Center for Student Diversity and Inclusion on a project related to the history of LGBTQ plus life at CMU. For decades, members of the LGBTQAI plus um, student organizations have been collecting and storing what are now historic materials in the cabinets of their community space, SOHO. We had a pop-up event in October to celebrate both LGBTQ plus History Month and announce uh, this important collection. We hope that this will be the first of many opportunities for community members and current students to engage with these materials and participate in community archiving workshops. In addition to all of this, we've increased our outreach. We were present during orientation, uh, the Student Activities Fair, Scotty Saturday, uh, and hosted an archives open house uh, during Tartan Community Day. And we will continue doing more outreach in the next semester, so look for us around campus. If you'd like to learn more, uh, discuss your community's history, or get involved, please send me an email or visit our initiative website. Uh, the link will be posted in the chat. You can also drop in during our open hours on Thursdays between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. Thank you. As Jules' professor said, yes. It's been a wonderful evening. Thank you, Wanda and Jules, for entertaining us, for educating us for challenging us. This is an event that will stay with all of us for a long time, and we're truly grateful for your observations and for sharing your deeply personal experiences. I'm grateful also to Crystal for sharing with us your important work in the university archives. If anyone would like to learn more about Crystal's work, I think we've dropped links in the chat, um, but she also is available on Thursdays between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. if you'd like to drop into the University Archives in Hunt Library. At the University Libraries, we value innovation, accessibility, collaboration, and service. And we strongly believe that diversity, equity, and inclusion enhance these values. If you'd like to support our work, I encourage you to consider giving to our Friends of the Library Fund. Your support strengthens our vital role as a convener of interdisciplinary activities and as a central, neutral, safe gathering place for the CMU community to have campus-wide discussions, such as the one we've had this evening. There are, of course, other ways to stay engaged with this important topic at the libraries. We have frequent book displays that explore various topics around diversity and inclusion. Our current display featuring some of Jules' work has been curated by Wanda's office, focusing on the power of representation. And if you can't make it into Hunt Library, our exhibitions are also made available on our website. We're also launching a book club kit that will be available from the Hunt Library circulation desk. You and your group of friends or colleagues can borrow those kits, which include multiple copies of a book and some discussion questions to help you dig a little deeper. One of our first kits features Jules' novel, Ghost Boys, which was an instant bestseller and won more than 30 awards. So thank you for attending this evening. I'm so pleased you could join us. I hope that you will come to our future events. And the next one that we will be hosting is Fine and Rare Part Two, during which curator of special collections, Dr. Sam Lemley, 
We'll share more about the library's plans to celebrate the 400th anniversary of Shakespeare's first folio in 2023. Um, without spoiling Sam's uh, presentation too much, I'd like to ensure that you're all aware that we will be partnering with the Frick Museum in Pittsburgh to have two exhibitions, one here in Hunt Library, but a very special one at the Frick Museum running between April and October next year. We're doing this because we are holders of one of only 230 surviving copies of the first folio, and it's a tremendous opportunity for us to celebrate such a landmark work and for us all to learn more about its history. So with that, again, thank you for being with us this evening. Thanks again to our speakers and have a great evening.